Hello, everyone. Today, I'm delighted to have on the show Michael Donnelly and Garrett Mayerson. Michael is the head honcho for Barrier Free Contractors, which is based in Cape Coral, which is near Fort Myers, Florida. And Garrett works with him, but is also a disability inclusion consultant. So we're going to talk to them about the amazing work they're doing in the housing space in their area. So welcome to the show, guys. Nice to be here. Thanks for having us. So, Michael, let's start, if you could, by telling us a little bit about your company, what it is you're doing. Well, I've been buying and selling real estate since 1981. I learned the construction trade through a lot of mistakes on my own properties. Now, leading up to about six years ago, I was always looking for the money. What can I buy next? What can I build next? What can I do to find a way to, to keep the hamster wheel of money making going? And I got damn sick of it. So what happened was I met an individual that said, why don't you get involved with helping disabled and seniors to have a better life? Now, I knew nothing about that. I mean, I, I knew about disabled and seniors, but I didn't know what kind of life they had and why I should get involved in it. Well, long story short, I, I listened to what the guy had to say. It was on a Saturday. On Sunday, I started researching it in my area. Found out there was nobody really doing it. And I couldn't figure out why because it seemed like it was a market that needed help. So Just back I, up a sec. Sorry. Yeah. When you say nobody was really doing it, you mean nobody building accessible housing? Is nobody that was mean? building accessible housing or truly getting involved with retrofitting accessible housing. Oh, so that was amazing to me because it was a market that wasn't being served. And I thought, well, let me, let me do some research. So about two or three days later, after, after checking it all out, I was building in the process of building about 40 to 50 homes at that time. And, and they were all- Per year. Uh, was that? Per year, right? 40 to well, 50 homes a not, year? No, about, uh, 100, about 100 and some odd homes total. But during that specific time, I had 40, about 45 houses in the ground being built. Oh, I so, see. Yeah. So that was fine. I had to finish those houses. But I thought, why don't I get involved with something that truly really can help somebody? It would change their lives. It would change my life. And nobody was doing it, like I said, basically. I found out later that it was going to take a massive amount of, of invested capital to make that work, which I didn't think it would, but that's okay. I got involved in it, learned the process, and now seven years later, I'm an overnight success. Okay, okay. <laughs> seven years. It's just about, yeah. So what does that been, mean to you to be a uh, success? Like, what do you, how do you define it? When I walk out of a job, when I change the people's lives that are in a wheelchair, or can't get out of a bed, or the caregivers that are involved with them, and I can change their lives and make their life better, they are truly satisfied. Not like, most people that want something more and more and more ego driven on a daily basis. I was able to find true satisfaction as a contractor when I was done with those jobs, changed my life completely. So there, that's where it is. And that's what I do now. And the overnight success thing was marvelous. It's truly a great thing in my life and in many others. So your company builds housing that is accessible to begin with, and it also retrofits existing homes to be accessible. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, I do. I'm currently building three side by side right now that are, we call them accessible barrier free homes. Yeah, and so, I have a lot of retrofit jobs. Oh, wonderful. So let's talk about the new construction. What are you doing differently with your construction style that makes these homes accessible, barrier-free, according to your criteria? What, what are important architectural and building things that you do? Well, first of all, it costs me no more money to do the accessibility side. And what I mean by that is I had them engineered so that there was no steps going into a house, no steps going into the garage, all the way through to the laundry room. Every door was 36 inches so that it was easily accessible to a wheelchair. I have roll-in showers, which now a person in a chair can take a shower without having to be uh, assisted in every capacity to get over a curb or to get into a tub. So that I call that a standard barrier-free house because it can be utilized by anybody that's got mobility issues. Now, we get more intense in terms of 
we can do more universal design things, which are specialty items. But to just to have a basic house like that enables somebody to have a much better, more independent existence. So, Michael, what makes, are you able to sell these homes at a competitive price compared to builders that don't do these types of features? Let me tell you the most, the, the coolest thing about this is that the house, uh, you got a second for a story? Please, absolutely. All right, well, here's, the, here, here's the deal. I have a, a, a lifetime associate, actually my Dominican child named Jose. Jose and I he had to go do, uh, we had to do a, uh, a warranty job on a sliding glass door that wasn't working properly. The lady was Cuban. Jose speaks Spanish. We went into the house. She had, she had bought the last of the barrier-free houses that I had built uh, a couple years ago. So she got us over there. Jose said to her, do you know what kind of house you have? And she said, I like my house, but I don't know what the heck you're talking about. So he walked her around to every one of these accessible features. And she was blown away. She did not even know it. Okay. And she said, oh, my God, my father-in-law can now come to visit me because right. he, could not, he could never get into the houses that she had. I love so that. my point in telling you that story is probably one of the greatest marketing scenarios that I've ever been involved with. Because what it said to me is this, that that house will sell to anybody. But we've increased the market by 10 to 15% based on seniors that can't step up and people in chairs there that can't get into homes. There's a great, great market for it. And nobody's tapping it except us. And why do you think <clears throat> that is? Because I think that people get caught up in like the big, big home builders, especially. They're, they're not willing to change. Yeah. Well, and believe me, when I say the seven years to an overnight success, it takes a lot of investment capital and persistence and patience to get through this thing, to know what you got to do and to make the changes necessary to help others. Right, right. Well, that's wonderful. I want to bring you into this conversation, Garrett. So you described yourself as a disability inclusion consultant. Tell us what that means and what you do with Michael in his business. Well, that's a very good question. To me, it means, first of all, I was born with cerebral palsy. So I've lived with a disability my whole life. And because of that, I've seen issues like housing accessibility being an issue for me and a lot of other people. So I take it upon myself to say, when I graduate college, what do I want to do for a career that was obvious? Well, which is disability advocacy and consulting. So what that means is I consult with people in terms of saying you have to make your community inclusive because it's the right thing to do. And there's also money in it for you. So, and people, once I explain it to them, they often pay me for it or want to hear my opinion and how I work with Mike is from my perspective, telling him why barrier-free housing is important and helping him market it and get the word out. And he's even teaching me construction, his methods and secret sauce. So um, that we can bring this down to my neck of the woods. You're on the other side of Florida. Um, than him. So, Garrett, when you're promoting Mike's vision in your area, what are you saying to contractors? What are you saying to the people you're trying to reach? Well, like Mike said, we have to find the right kind of people because there's people that don't really want to do this. So I'm saying that it's it's the right thing to do. It's the same as any other home, and it's common sense. And what is the main pushback you get? You say people don't want to do this. What is the main pushback you get? The main pushback I get is that they don't want to spend money. It's costly to do this. And they just don't see it as a viable opportunity. So we have to persuade them that it is. Okay. So, Mike, do you agree? Like, you're a success after a certain amount of investment. Um, you put in a lot of capital to do this. And I know that you're a bit of, you know, an unusual person in terms of contractors around the country that I've talked to. What do you say to people you're trying to encourage to do this, to get them to see the bigger picture? You know, when they come back at you as we can't afford it. Well, they can, but they, a lot of them won't really listen. I right. personally will help finance them. Really? Oh, yeah. You have a financing arm? That's well, cool. I, I've done that in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So if I've, got, if I've got to take less for a job or have them structure payments to me over time, I will do that. You know, the main thing is to walk out of there with a happy, 
to change a person's life. Because in the reality, the long run is to look up, up above us and to make sure that we end our lives in a way that I call it finish with a flourish. Mm-hmm. To find a way that will help others only helps me, helps Garrett, helps people that are in this to have a better life for those that we're helping. And of course, ours, we've enhanced our ability to meet our maker the proper way. But as far as the investment goes in this, an ounce of preparation on the new build is, is worth everything. Because I, I was at a $3.5 million house on Wednesday last week. The guy, I no matter how rich he is, and, and this is what one of the great things that somebody told me was, we are all temporarily able-bodied. That's so true. Okay? So this guy, this guy had multi-million dollars. Now he's in a power wheelchair. It just happened like within the last couple of months. So the house that he built had steps that he couldn't access. And it's, it's in a HOA, beautiful community, beautiful homes, but the guy can't even get in his house. And the homeowners association won't let him do certain things without certain colors being met. And, you know, I go into a litany of the reasons behind this. But the guy can't get in his house. Three and a half million dollars, he can't get in. Now, if he had wow. simply prepared for that house to be done the right way up front, still looking fantastic. And now he would never have a problem. Right. So that's, that's in general how the new build should go down. Everybody should know that they should build a house for a possible problem down the road. And yet it looks just the same and it looks beautiful. So one of the things that I noticed is that you have an active YouTube channel, and we'll share that with the listeners later, but you have an active YouTube channel with a lot of informational videos on it. What's your thinking around creating the YouTube channel? Two things. First of all, broadcast the message. To be able to tell somebody how to do a barrier-free bathroom or roll under sink or a, a certain way to to open a doorway and enlarge a door, or to build a house the right way, to do it from scratch. That was the basic message. And it goes back to, let's just help people have a better life. And yet, and Garrett's a big part of this, helping monetize that in a certain way to market through this whole thing is a huge plus. Now, that's the best way to make money, isn't it? To, to profit from helping somebody. And that's kind yeah. of where this whole thing was going. But at first, it wasn't even... I didn't even think of it as profit. I thought of it, let's broadcast the message. But it turns out a lot of people are looking at it and there's a way to do that. The, the marketing of, of it to, to help others and to, and to actually make some money with it. So, Michael, what I understand that you have developed a nonprofit side to this. You've developed a foundation. or Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Called Liberty Access Foundation. Yeah. The goal behind that was I, I saw on a yearly basis the Wounded Warrior Project which would be done once a year, which was great, fantastic, you know, but it was done once a year. What about the rest of the people out there that need help now? So what the intention was, because subcontractors might, or people like myself, we can do some free projects, no question, but you can't do it consistently. You've yeah. got to be able to keep your business floating. So what the foundation was built to be able to accept money and to be able to do two, three, four retrofits at a time utilizing the subcontractors and paying those subcontractors at least a decent wage so that they're willing to go in and get these jobs done quickly and efficiently so that we can multiply the efforts versus that one a year. So Garrett, how has your housing search been impacted by meeting Mike? Well, it's actually been impacted in a number of ways because the plan is at some point to try to build that type of house that he's building, which is an accessible barrier-free home in my neck of bullets, which is going to be huge, really huge, if that, if that can come to fruition, which I hope it can. And to do that, you need to find local, like Mike, you don't build on his side of the state, right? Your, your projects are primarily on the West, right? Well, I could go over there without any problem doing that, and I, and I would for Garrett. But to be able to find, and Garrett searching for these people, to find more contractors out there that would just follow my lead, basically. Yeah. You know, we, can, we can give them plans. We can show them how to do it. And they don't have to go through the overnight success thing of seven-year learning curve. Okay, They can, they can learn right from me from Jump Street because they're builders. Right. They know how to do it. It's just a matter right. of constructing the home in the right way. So 
What do you think, apart from cost, are there other things that we need to do to reach these contractors to get them to build more projects like this and to give Garrett an opportunity to have this happen in his side of the state too? Well, Garrett's on the mission now to contact these, these people, the contractors out there. And if they could speak to me, which I can only do so much in terms of marketing. That's why Garrett's heav heavily involved in this and it's great. Mm -hmm. Another gentleman named Vinny Venagopal is also working with us. And the three of us are really marketing this, mar marketing this heavily. And the idea is to, to connect with a couple contractors, have them speak to me, let me show them how it's done. And the reason behind this, and that is profit with a purpose. Now, if you've right. got that, if you can still make money and have somebody be happy, like I was describing to you earlier, there is no better feeling. But I got to tell you, there's very few that truly have the heart for this. Yeah. What do you think that is? Uh, agreed. You know, agreed. I mean, well, when you, when you, I grew up as an idealistic child until I was probably about 18, 16 to 18. All of a sudden, you know, I got to make some, I got to make some money. Changes your whole life. The idealism left me. It went into money. And money yeah. stayed with me for, me for many, many years. And until I was not smart enough, but I was slapped across the face and said, listen, wake up, fella, because you've got you to end your life in the right, right way, as I was describing before. That's what every one of us has to realize in life anyways. But us contractors really need to understand that, yes, you can make a good, good living, a great living, helping those that really need it. You know, it's a very real problem. Garrett, you shared with me how hard your housing search has been. Can you share with my listeners a little bit about your struggles that you've had finding housing? Oh, absolutely. The way the, the wow. laws is in the Fair Housing wow. Act is, it kind of pigeonhole, pigeonholes somebody who is in my situation because you can't rent. Even if you have the money, it's more expensive to rent than it is to, to buy a house or and get and get a retrofitted or build a house like Mike's trying to do it. It's really unfair and really unjust in my opinion. So that's the kind of thing that I've encountered is that I found a place places to rent and stuff, and they both said, "Well, you have to pay for the your accommodations and stuff like that. It's not our responsibility." And then, then that's extra cost to me because you have to do you know your rent, your security deposit your first and last, all of these things. And then you have to pay for them to put it back to where it was. <laughs> so, so, so an example might be that you rent a place, but it's very unlikely to have a roll-in shower or a shower tub system that would work for you. But because of fair housing law, although the landlord cannot prevent you from having these things, you have to put them in at your own expense and potentially remove them when you leave, right? Exactly. So the goal would be to get permanent, affordable housing that you can never have to worry about having to leave or having to lose it when uh, or pay some fee to take it out or anything like that, or have being able to buy something that's already going to work for you, right? Right, that's my goal. And unfortunately, there's unless someone is selling it currently, there's nothing like that on the market unless you yeah. build it. The other thing is one of the things I'm working on is going to be policy, changing policy, either on a state level, federal level, one of my contacts is going to help me figure that out. And I'm going to work with Mike and Benny to figure out how that works. But well, yeah, I had a, I had a guest on my show about a year ago, I think, I, I don't remember exactly when, who was trying to get the federal Congress to pass legislation to create a tax break for people who did renovations for accessibility in their homes. The bill didn't make it through Congress because of the 2022 midterms when the Democrats lost the House, among other reasons. But that kind of legislation, would it make it easier for home owners to afford to retrofit existing homes? And, you know, I'm sure, Michael, that you would like to see more financial support for homeowners who have to do these retrofits, because it can't be inexpensive for them to come to you and have you do this as much as you're passionate about it. It's still an expensive thing to to do retrofit of an existing home versus building the home right in the first place, right? Yeah, it's not cheap. You know, to do a bathroom, as you know, I think that's one of the more expensive items in a home. Same with the kitchen. Widen the doorway. I mean, all these things cost money. 
And and yes, if there was some kind of legislation, that would be fantastic. And I know Gira is going to be looking at this strongly. But in the meantime, you keep the ball rolling. If I can find a way to help somebody, I'm definitely going to do that because it only makes sense. Now, they pay me monthly. They pay me when they can. All that stuff is going to be applicable to each individual person. But it's doable. And it's just it's just so much fun to do. It's just great. <laughs> Do you guys think there's a role for education to help society look at housing differently than the way we do? Absolutely. But um, I do think that there's a role because in general, people don't look, look at it. it. If you don't know somebody with a disability, you're not going to look, look at it and say, oh, wow, this is not accessible. You're, you're not going to look, look at it. it. People don't even know what barrier free is. We have That's to explain true. to people what it is. Yeah, that is, and also, that is so true. I'm telling you, that is, in a nutshell, why we have to broadcast this in a huge way. Because people like me, it had no clue until I started getting into it. Once I, once I saw it, oh my, I said, I'm like, this is unbelievable. The need is incredible. But I didn't know that. And so, so you, gotta, you just got to keep pounding away at broadcasting this, which is what we're doing. One of the things that I've found in my several years of doing this podcast and in my advocacy in my own community in California is that we have to also be thinking about the fact that we have an aging society and we are not building housing or communities for that matter with an eye towards that. Because like you mentioned before, one day you could be high flying and not even thinking about this. And the next time, next minute you are disabled or as you age, you lose mobility and why should you have to move just because you, you know, get older and, you know, need more uh, mobility support? And that's just one example. So, you know, thinking about aging is really, really important, too, I think. Yeah. Vinny is heavily into the, he's got his CAP certification. That's you know right. That? He yes. was telling, okay. yeah. Yeah. And so he's on that side of our equation more so. He's, yeah. you know, we're all involved to a degree in all of it, but Vinny's more in that world than I am. But the aging in place thing can be when you're 30 years old till you die, or you're just a senior and you need a place to stay without going into assisted living facility. All these things are applicable. How do you make their life more independent and fully accessible? So, I mean, everybody has their own story and yeah. you just got to adapt to that story and make that home better. And that's the, that's the beauty of building new because that person can basically describe to you to customize their own features, what they need to make their life better. Yeah. Two points. First of all, for my listeners who don't know, CAPS stands for Certified Aging in Place. And it's a certification that people can get to have a specialty in helping people to do that. The other point I wanted to make is we need to start thinking about how we build communities. Communities, not just the individual houses, but whole communities so that when you leave your house and when you want to go visit your neighbor's house, so you want to go to something in your town or nearby, it is accessible as your own house hopefully will be. Yeah, that's a good point, Stephen. I, I, I will say that because as a person who is in a chair, when I go to somebody's house, that's not my house, I have to bring a ramp. 99% of the time I might do that. <laughs> You know, if, if I didn't have to worry about no, that, that would be great. You know, some say we've made a lot of strides in the last 40 years because of the Americans with Disabilities Act in helping to improve awareness around these issues. But I still think, I personally think there's a long way still to go. And I think that the issue of how we think about construction, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike or Garrett, but how we think about building communities, building houses and building housing and building neighborhoods, we have a long way to go. To say the least, yeah. okay, every house that I go into, I'd say 99.5% of the homes that I go into are inaccessible in some fashion, if, if not in all fashions. So yes, we have a long way to go, but not as far now because we've got people like Garrett that, that are willing to, to knock on doors and, and to start spreading the word and getting into the community build scenario, I'm in, I'm in contact now with some, uh, some groups of money, okay, that, will, that are interested in doing that. But I will not work with anybody that doesn't have a heart for this. If you have a heart for it 
and you want to put your money up, fantastic, but don't put your money up for the return on investment only. The return on investment comes from, from the overall perspective of helping the other people. And I will add too, is, is that, you know, people really, they need to think about apartment buildings too when it comes to real estate developer. I mean, we're building housing so that people can have permanent housing, but yes. if somebody doesn't want to buy a house right away and they want to be able to stay in an apartment building, that needs to be considered too, because I don't need no, any BS excuse. Somebody telling me, oh, I need to think about the structure of this build. <laughs> yeah. So, Mike, if the, you could align the universe and jump forward five years from now, what would it all look like in your, in your world, in, in your business? What would it look like five years from now if you could make it happen? We would be multi-billionaires <laughs> that, 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 kick, <laughs> that kick back in all of the money, maybe except a nice trip to a mountain lake, okay, and utilize that money to continue to build those houses. because. When I see a person's life changed, and I've said it about five times in this interview, when I see a person's life changed, your life changes instantly. It's, it's a feeling of satisfaction that only you can get in this, in this business. I mean, this is the only way I could get it in this business. So that's five years from now. I would have all these fantastic feelings, making a ton of money, kicking it back to making those people happy. What about you, Garrett? What would you like to see the world look like in five years? That's a very good question. Honestly, I would like, besides me being multi billionaires, but like, um, <laughs> and Vinny, um, I would really like to see the world more accessible and housing more accessible and, and very free and universally designed. And I think that's what we're doing. That, that's one of the things that excited me about when I first met Mike and working with him is, is that vision of universal design. So if I can help five years from now, making that a possibility and a reality, I would love that. That's great. Do you guys have any final thoughts or things you'd like to share with my listeners before we wind it up? Yes, join us. You know, hook up with Garrett, hook up with myself. Find a way to help if possible or to just spread the word. Whatever you can do to help a person have a better life pays its, I call it selfish unselfishness, Stephen. You know, being very selfish in being unselfish. Because when you can do that and help people, all those points that you look upward to the pie in the sky, that's what you're living for, is to have a better overall life and eternal, eternal life. And I would like to add to that, as Mike said, we're all temporarily able-bodied. And so you really have to think about, you know, that you're not gonna be able-bodied forever and that accessibility is really important and it is, it is viable and there is a profit to be made from it. And there, it is a good thing for people to be barrier free and universally designed and it's just good for everyone. So I want people to think about that. And I know if they're listening to your podcast, they are well aware of that. So I don't have to, I'm preaching to the choir right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, mm -hmm. I think my listeners will be very interested in hearing about your work, Mike, and your work, Garrett, and I will absolutely enjoy sharing our conversation with my listeners and hopefully with a broader community and helping to increase all, all of our general awareness about the importance of all this stuff. And I want to thank you guys so much for making time to be on my show today. Thanks, Steve. It's my pleasure. Very much so. Thank you very much.